Um, we finished discussing the um, various ways in which we can combine the isotope data to determine ages. And now I want to talk about uh, one of the significant problems that we face with the argon ligand geochronology, which um, is important to appreciate, especially if you're trying to decide what kind of material to date. If you're working on a project that has several possibilities, this is useful to know um, in, in selecting samples. And this is what I call the recoil problem. So first we have to review a little bit about what happens in the nuclear reactor when we irradiate samples. And what I'm showing here is the, uh, first of all, the cross-section function for this reaction. So this is the sigma, if you remember, which is part of the integral which defines the J value, except that we don't actually use that. But this is, this is what it looks like as a function of neutron energy. So remember, this is the probability of this reaction occurring. And so at relatively low neutron energies, below one mega electron volt, the probability is very low for this reaction. It increases very steeply up to about three MeV. And then after that, very slowly. So what we really would like to have is neutrons with an energy somewhere in this region um, because neutrons with energies up here don't really give us much more production of argon-39. What they do, though, is create some problems for us. Just, just to finish describing this, this diagram, this yellow curve, phi, is the um, relative neutron flux in a typical fission reaction, like the one in Oregon, which we and most other people use. So what this tells you is that the majority of the neutrons in this type of reactor are fairly low energy. And the neutrons in this region become less and less abundant. And I don't have a scale for this. This is just relative units. And this, this function varies from reactor to reactor. So it's typical of the Oregon reactor, but other reactors have different, different curves. This cross-section function is um, specific for this reaction. It has nothing to do with the reactor. This is pure physics. And remember that the production of, of this uh, quantity is a function of the product of this function times this function. So that number is this flat curve. This is phi times sigma. And so the amount of argon-39 that we produce is the integral of this function. So it's the area under this curve. Right. So Tomorrow, uh, when I give the seminar, I'm going to talk about other ways to, to create neutrons in this energy range, which are ideal for us. But for now, I really want to focus only on the fact that neutrons with energies much higher than what we need, i.e. up in here, are a problem for us because they cause a phenomenon called recoil. So let me describe this. When the reaction occurs, a neutron strikes a potassium-39 atom and emits a photon. The argon-39 atom that's created by this process is displaced. It moves just by conservation of energy. And so what that means is that in any object, any potassium-containing object, like a crystal, because of this process, there will be a zone around the edge of the crystal where the argon-39 is lost. It's, it's ejected. This is similar to the alpha ejection problem that uranium, thorium, helium uh, people have to worry about. But 
anyway, the, the dimensions of this zone are on the order of 100 nanometers, or 0 0.1 microns. And this depletion layer, of course, it's not 100% depleted. I'll show you what the, what the profiles look like. But this is the problem. So what this means is that the argon-40, which forms from decay of potassium-40, may be here, and the argon-39 atom is ejected. So this means, what would this mean for the age? If you lose argon-39, but you keep argon-40. Anybody know, would that make the age too young or too old? Remember the ratio that we measured? Argon-40 over argon-39? So if we lose argon-39, that ratio increases. So what does that do for the age? Increases. So we can cause two old ages by this phenomenon. So let's look at some examples. So these are real examples. So here is a sample which has an age spectrum that looks like this. And this kind of behavior can happen when argon-39 is recoiled into um, sites where it's removed in the lowest temperatures of the extraction. So that means you have excess argon-39, so the age would be too young, but only for these steps. Then you move into steps where the gas is coming from inside the crystal where there's too much 40. Argon-39 has been lost, so the ages in here are too old. And then in some cases, you get after that a plateau, which is meaningful. So this is, this is the real age spectrum. This one is uh, synthetic. So in this situation, there's still a plateau and it's probably meaningful. So even though you have argon-39, which has been recoiled to near grain surfaces and then comes off in the low temperature steps to be two young ages, then two old ages, and then correct ages, that's fine. You can still determine the age of the sample. But the overall loss of argon-39 means that if you add up all of the steps and calculate an age from the total amount of gas, which by the way should be equivalent to a potassium argon age, it will be too old because this excess age is more than compensating this deficiency in age. Now, what also happens sometimes is you have the same behavior in these low temperature steps, too young, too old, and then the ages decrease monotonically, more or less. And the problem is, <coughs> so what, what is happening here is that argon-39, imagine that right here, let's say this is a plagiotase crystal right here. And right next to it is an olivine crystal. And the argon-39 is implanted into the olivine crystal from the edge of the plagiotase. Now, the argon-39 in the olivine is much more difficult to remove by heating because argon-39, argon in general, diffuses much more slowly in olivine than in plagiotase. So this implanted argon-39 only comes out in the high temperature steps. So the age continues to decrease. And um, in this case, if the errors are large enough, you could have what appears to be a plateau. Imagine these errors were twice as big. This would all seem like a plateau, but it would be meaningless. It would be um, 
probably too young in this case. So these are some of the things that, that can happen. I'll show you another example that I think is more clear. This is, this is why I say recoil can be a very dangerous thing. So several years ago, we did an experiment with biotite, and we took different sizes of biotite, um, which this is actually a standard whose age is about 99 million years old. And we took different size fractions. So this is 200 microns, 50 down to just a few microns. And we analyzed them. And um, this is a theoretical curve, which is a function, it's calculated based on what we thought we knew about recoil. And what we found is that the very smallest biotites give ages, these are normalized to the original age, they're normalized to, to these ages. So we found up to 25% greater ages for the very, very small fractions, which means they lost a lot of their argon-30 mass, a huge percentage. And the fact that we see this problem really beginning at about 50 microns tells you that the theory was not wrong. I mean, it was not correct. So it's a bigger problem than, than what we thought. So this, this dimension, 50 microns, is the thickness of the biotite. So just how thick it is. The, the lateral distance doesn't really matter because recoil is a surface effect. And in fact, um, we had to analyze larger crystals in this dimension um, for the very thin grain in order to get enough gas to analyze. And you can still see that the error bars are very large for these small ones because there's so little gas that the uncertainty is quite a bit larger. But the trend is still unmistakable. So the, the, the upshot of this is that if you want to date very, very thin micas or very, very small grains of anything, you have to be very careful about this. In fact, it's better just not to date materials that are smaller than 50 microns in general. So recoil is, to some extent, is dependent on, it's dependent on the energy of the neutrons, so the, the, the higher energy neutrons, there's more recoil but also the properties of the mineral, basically the density of the mineral. So biotite is, is especially bad, um, and it's, it's especially important because biotite is a very commonly dated mineral by the potassium argon, argon, argon technique. <coughs> but this recoil problem does not affect potassium argon because we don't irradiate samples for that method. So this is one disadvantage of the argon, argon method. More examples. Here's a crystal of biotite, or actually several crystals. One, two, three, four. And these biotite crystals have uh, chlorite intergrown along layers. And this is actually a very common alteration of biotite. You get replacement of the biotite by chlorite, sometimes vermiculite, other phyllosilicates. And um, they grow exactly along the crystallographic plane. So you're looking at these crystals on edge. If I were to show the, the C-axis of these crystals, it would be like this. And we mounted them specially so that we could see this. So what you see here is chlorite in the yellow forming the outer part of the biotite. And the fresh, unaltered biotite is in the middle. So it's a nice little biotite sandwich. And probably everybody has seen this type of thing in the field, it's, it's very common you see biotite has kind of a greenish color, and this is typically what it is. So let's look at what happens when we step heat one single crystal of this biotite. Here's the age spectrum. You get a very young age, and then a step up, and then a nice well-defined plateau. This is a single crystal, so we don't have a lot of material, so not, not very detailed step heating experiments. But if you didn't know anything else, 
you would look at these data and you would say, ah, okay, nice plateau, it's 488 million years old, end of story, that's it. But we have independent evidence that this is the true age here, about 454 million, or 400, actually it's 458 million. Um, and that's what the integrated age is. The integrated age is what you get if you add all the gas up from all these steps together and calculate the age that you do here with the passing Mahan age. So what this is telling us is that these crystals have experienced a redistribution of argon-39, but not a, total, not a net loss because the integrated age is exactly what we expect. Now let me go back to the picture. So what's happening here is that during the radiation, well, first of all, just remind you that the chlorite has essentially no potassium. This biotite has about 8% potassium by weight based on microfluidic analysis. So when you irradiate the sample, argon-39 recoils from the biotite into the chlorite, and chlorite loses its argon more easily. It has a looser structure, and you need it. So the first step that we measure here is mostly coming from the chlorite. So it has too much argon-39, so it's too young. The next step is a mixture, and now, by this temperature, the remaining argon-39 in the biotite has been homogenized because at high enough temperature, the argon is, is moving around. And so now you get this plateau, which is actually meaningless. But this, this is very tricky because if you didn't have any other idea, you would just assume that this is a plateau and it's meaningless. This, to me, was a very, <laughs> very important illustration of the importance of recoil. Whoa, right? Okay. So I mentioned that we have devised uh, a method for producing neutrons that have a very limited energy range that is right exactly where we would like to have them. So this is a process called deuteron deuterium fusion. You take an atom of hydrogen mass 2, which is also called deuterium, and undergo nuclear fusion with a deuterium ion, which is called a deuteron, and this makes helium-3 plus a neutron. And this neutron has an energy of 2.45 MeV, which if you remember is right at the peak of where we would like to be. So we have all the benefit of a maximum production of this, of this um, reaction, but we don't have these higher energies which are mostly responsible for the recoil. So this is great. And I have a project now that we actually are building a reactor to, uh, to do this. And if anybody is interested more in how that works, um, I'll talk about this tomorrow in my lecture. But this is the basic idea. So this is just a, a graph that's just symbolic, really, showing um, the cross-section um, of this reaction for several, actually for several different reactions. One with the deuterium-deuteron reaction, which is the one I just mentioned, shown in these diamonds. And then deuterium-tritium, which is um, hydrogen-3, and then tritium-tritium which is these triangles here, or sorry, these triangles. So what this, what this plot shows you is that the cross-section for this reaction, that is the probability of this reaction occurring, is approaching a maximum at something like 100 kilo electron volts. So you have to accelerate these deuterons up to pretty high energies, 100 keV or so, to get the maximum probability of this reaction occurring. So this is what we're actually doing. Again, I'll talk more about that tomorrow. But just to show you that we have, we have some ideas to, to help uh, 
solve this problem of evil. And <coughs> here's an illustration. We haven't, we haven't actually made any of these new kinds yet, although we should be pretty close, but we can model the results. And here's a comparison, taking a sheet, um, which we model as an infinite slab, so it has a finite thickness, but infinite dimensions in this way and this way. And we irradiate that with um, the fission spectrum of neutrons, which is what you get in the normal reactor, and the ZD neutrons, which is what we're in the process of making. And this is what the depletion profile looks like. So the, the depth of the, the depletion zone um, versus the amount of argon-39 lost, you can see that up to um, almost 0.25 microns, you have significant loss with conventional fission spectrum neutrons. But with the DD reactor, we can go down to less than 0.1 micron and have no significant uh, argon-39 nuclei loss. So that's a pretty significant improvement. And this, this improvement is really in a very important geological range because this really enables us to, to analyze minerals like uh, clay minerals. Um, well, I'll show you some examples of that. Oops. So here are some of, the, some of the types of materials that are very prone to recoil with conventional neutrons, but that we hope to be able to analyze um, successfully using these, I call them designer neutrons. So one such um, uh, type of material is the calcium aluminum rich inclusions in meteorites. These are found in, in many um, chondrites and these are the oldest objects in the solar system. These were thought to have condensed from the solar nebula, um, you know, the earliest 4.557 billion years ago. And they're composed of a very fine Intergrowth of pyroxenes, melilite, and anorthite. And the melilite has enough potassium that it can be um, analyzed, but it's very fine grain. And so people have tried to date these things, and they give they get ages that are pre-solar, like five billion years old. And uh, it's clearly a recoil problem. Another um, type of material we'd like to be able to analyze is glauconite, which is um, a sedimentary and orthogenic mineral that grows in certain sedimentary rocks and um, has the possibility of, of dating or constraining the age of deposition of sediment. And the problem with these, you might ask, well, why not just analyze these by potassium argon, which doesn't have recoil problems? The problem is that these kinds of things with very small grain size have almost always lost some argon by diffusion is a process we'll come to in a little while. But um, with potassium argon, you cannot see the effects of diffusion loss, whereas with argon-argon, you can. So this will be another important mineral, as with clay minerals, um, very similar properties, actually. And clay minerals are important not only because they can be orthogenic, uh, forming in basically in situ in sedimentary rocks, but also in hydrothermal ore deposits and so forth. And then uh, even in, in lavas, um, often the ground mass of lavas is very, very fine. And so um, the recoil problem can affect these too. Now in materials that are very compact, that have no pore space, recoil is less problematic because recoiling argon, let's say from this plagioclase crystallite here into a neighboring pyroxene doesn't mean that the, the argon will be lost, it just gets redistributed. So even if we see significant artifacts, we still can use the integrated age to, in other words, if we have a disturbed spectrum of the type that I showed earlier, we can still determine an age from the, from the integrated age. But by step heating it, you can, you can to some extent, um, check whether there was argon loss or alteration. So these are the kinds of materials that um, currently can give us problems. And lava ground mass is, is probably the least uh, problematic. 
and unless unless the grain size is very very small, I mean on the order of microns or maybe tens of microns, it's not too big a problem. Okay, so that's the recoil problem. Um, it is a significant one, but we have some ideas for for steering it or at least improving it. And now I want to um, discuss a few applications, just some, some diverse, I've chosen a few examples that illustrate sort of the range of problems that we can tackle with, with the all in all done method. So the first of these is um, the story of, of human evolution. And I mean, um, of course there's a significant story of human evolution right here in Mexico and in, in the Americas in general, but it's only very recent. And the, the whole time frame of human evolution goes back uh, at least five million years. And most of this um, story of, of human evolution comes from Eastern Africa, Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, for the most part. And this is an example of some of the various um, creatures of interest. Here's us. Um, here's Amenhabilis, slightly older human ancestor. And then various Australopithecus uh, species. This is one called Garhu. This is Africanus, Afluensis. This is the, the species that Lucy comes from, if you have heard of Lucy. And this is a chimpanzee, just for, just for comparison. So almost everything we know about the time scale of human evolution over this range, from five million years to several hundred thousand years. Almost everything we know comes from argon argon geochronology. There's no other geochronometer that's really appropriate to, uh, to apply over this age range. And um, it's important to, to understand the chronology of these different uh, fossils because very often all we have is a very few scattered fossils. And these, you have to realize that these, these skulls in general, are not found intact, but they're broken up into many pieces, so they have to be carefully assembled, and the record is not very complete. You can see, for example, this one has only a few features, and the rest is just a, an artist's idea of what the thing looks like. There's some, you know, anatomical values, but in any case, the record is, the fossil record is very sparse. We don't have very much to work with, and understanding the time relationships is hugely important for understanding the actual evolutionary sequence because with such a fragmental fossil record, it would be very difficult to understand how these various creatures are related in time without having exact dating. So I just want to show you, um, oh here's another version of the family tree. Um, so this one of the one of the basic features of the of the human family tree that seems to be fairly um, secure is that there was some early ancestor um, which was something like what's called Artipithecus, and I'm going to show you more about this in a minute, which at some point split from from Artipithecus. There evolved the Australopithecus. Um, lineages, and some seem not to have gone anywhere, and some continued up until very recent times. And then Homo somehow split off from this branch and evolved as a separate genus. But where Homo split off from Australopithecus is unclear. That's, that's an unsolved problem. But with more um, dating and more more fossils, maybe even more importantly, this, this link may ultimately be clear. So anyway, that's just a bit of background. And um, here's a picture of this creature, Australop of Artipithecus lamidus, which some people believe is the ancestor of both Australopithecus and Homo. This is not, not everybody agrees on this. In fact, in paleoanthropology, almost nobody agrees with anybody else. It's even worse than zoology, <laughs> but uh, so this is this is a fairly complete skeleton 
all of his future autofocifolds. It's actually more complete than we see, something like 70% complete. And this is an artist's picture of what this creature looks like. Pretty, pretty ape-like. And virtually all of the information, ab well, in fact, all of the information about Artipithecus and most of the information about Australopithecus and a lot of the information about Homo all come from Ethiopia and in particular from the Afar region of Ethiopia. So here's the Horn of Africa, Eastern Africa, the Afar Rift, the down drop, large drop on the trickle junction between East African Rift System, the Red Sea, and the Gulf of Aden. And um, you can see that most of these localities are just right in this, this area of the Afar. And that is to say, these are the ones that have been found. I mean, Homo ape-like is, is out there, but these are the, the significant areas. And this is what part of the Afar looks like. Um, <coughs> very significant lava plateau in the background. These are mostly flood basalts. Um, they're usually from about 20 million to 32 million years old. And then within the rift itself are a series of, of exposures um, by normal faults in the rift, uh, folks and gobbins, of sections that range from Pleistocene to, to uh, Miocene. And in particular, here's a place where there are uh, two tufts. So this is a silicic tuff, the spider sheen. This is several meters thick here. And in the background, you can see a much thinner basaltic tuff, which is composed mainly of basaltic glass or tillage. And you might notice that there's a fault that runs right through here. So this right here is asphalt sheen. You'll see in a, some paintings later on in this slide. And almost all of the Artipithecus ramidus that is known comes from the stratigraphic interval between this tuff and this tuff. So this is only about five meters. And something like 95% of all the Artipithecus ramidus fossils that have ever been found come from this stratigraphic interval. Over a wide area, mind you, of, well, you can go back and look at that, but it's, it's several tens of kilometers in area, but always in the same stratigraphic horizon. And we've been able to date this tuff at 12.39 million years. This one below at 12.39 million years. Now you might say, well, wait a minute. This one is younger than this one. How can that be? Well, look at the uncertainties. So within errors, they're, they're the same. So that means that we have the age for all this Artipithecus ramidus extremely well bracketed. And that's... That's how we are piecing together this history of human evolution, at least the timing aspect of it, is by bracketing the stratigraphic appearances of the fossils that dated up from the tufts. So let me show you now what the data look like in, in plain form. Oh, first of all, the lower tuff, I mentioned the upper tuff is, is composed of basaltic or tillage, glass. The lower tuff contains sanity and crater-like crystals, so we can date individual of these crystals. And these are the results. So for the basaltic glass, I analyzed these by step heating, got a very nice well-defined plateau, no evidence of uh, any significant recoil or alteration, and the plateau I did that, as I've shown you. For the lower silicic tuff, um, we have a little bit more complexity several venicus, one out here mo more than 30 million years old, one uh, population here composed of one, two, three, four, I guess it's five analyses that are about um, 23.5 to 24 million years old, two crystals at about 8 million years old, and then a dominant mode right here at 4. Point, essentially 4.4 million years old. So this is just another example of where one really needs to be able to analyze single crystals because some of these crystals in this tuff are reworked from older deposits and we don't know exactly how they get into the, the tuff, 
but we do know um, that there are some volcanics of this age up on the escarpment that I showed you earlier that are, that are basically trachytes, you know, they have, they have sand in them. So ultimately, we suppose these units are extinct on Earth. But if, <coughs> if we didn't have the ability to analyze single crystals one by one, we would never be able to precisely date this, this um, feature. Okay, so now we go to the moon. This is another example, obviously. <laughs> and this is a photograph that was taken actually of the Earth back here from the Apollo 14 landing site. So this is where we landed on the moon um, back in, I forget what year this was. Anybody know? 69 or 70, I was thinking. I, I, I believe in 69. Um, so this is just a reminder that the surface of the moon is heavily cratered, and the main reason for that is that um, basically the moon has no atmosphere to, to filter material, and maybe more importantly, um, no atmosphere and no hydrosphere to cover the evidence of this impact crater. So... Um, one of my colleagues suggested, who's a physicist, suggested that the lunar regolith, which is this material, it's called soil, but it's not soil by the criteria that we would use, but this material on the surface of the moon should have a very clear record of the history of impacts on the moon by meteoroids, and that record should be relatively undisturbed, and because the moon orbits the earth, the moon has, astronomically speaking, the same exact average position as the earth in the solar system, right, by an average. And so if we want to know more about the hi impact history of the earth, which is largely erased, we go to the moon. Great idea, I thought. Um, so the rationale was that this lunar regolith is absolutely full of these little glassy beads, um, you can see the scale here is one millimeter. So these are mostly um, less than one half a millimeter in dimension. And um, what these are is impact melt glasses that were quenched. So a meteor comes in, smashes into the target rocks, melts um, probably the meteoroid and the target rocks and possibly the lunar soil that's covering the target rocks and forms um, basically an instantaneous magma, which then is distributed far away from the crater. So the idea was that because these materials get spread all over the moon in the absence of gravity and with the constant flux of meteoroids hitting the moon, these materials travel very far from where the actual impact was. So the idea is that we could sample a large area of the moon just from a single sample just from a sample this big. And um, if you look at these, these spherules, um, we, we could call these tektites too. They're, they're exactly the same as tektites. Um, you can see from the diversity of colors that there, there is a broad compositional range. These darker ones are basically basaltic in composition. These lighter colored ones are basically plagioclase composition, and so they were derived from anorthosite, which is a common rock type on the moon. And um, so a very heterogeneous population. And that was encouraging because the whole idea is to sample a very diverse set of, of materials in hopes that that would be representative of some large portion of the lunar surface. So we analyzed a number of these by Stefini, and we used isoclines because we're younger. We don't use an air correction for these materials. <coughs> and we use these normal isoclines rather than inverse isoclines because it just it, it's a better gives a better view of the data. But the results would be the same either way. And um, these are just four of the analyses. And these are small objects that have very, very low potassium contents. So we're only able to <coughs> derive between, say, five and 10 steps from each of these. So these are steps needed with the laser. And you can see that in many cases, we have just a few relatively precise analyses and a few less precise ones. Um, 
you know, and the ages of the students, because it might be difficult for you. This was an age of 1,489 million years, 3,217, 51 plus or minus 4, which is at least the youngest one that we gave them, which means 3,857, 3.8 billion years old. Now let's look at the um, initial argon isotope ratio from the intercept, which means 0 0.4 plus or minus 0 0.01, 0 0.75 plus or minus 0 0.03, 0 0.42 plus or minus 0 0.01, and 1.38 plus or minus 0.31. So they're all very, very low and in the neighborhood of about one, which if you remember from lack of birth of meteorites, is a pretty typical ratio for meteorites as well. So um, these are just a few of the results, and we actually analyzed quite a few. Um, I think the next slide is going to tell us how many. Uh, 155 of these spherules, and shown down here are the individual ages depicted as Gaussian distribution. So the very broad flat ones are imprecise isochronic ages and the very sharp, narrow ones are the very precise isochron ages. And so we see a lot of um, ages in the four to 3.2 billion years that we've used. And then not a whole lot until you get down into here. And then a very surprising spike here within the last 500 million years, which was kind of surprising because most, most theories of the impact history of the moon would look something like this. So in the earliest history of the solar system, gravitational accretion is, is making objects coalesce. There's a lot of collisions, a lot of impacts going on. And then as the solar system essentially cleans itself up, you get fewer and fewer, or you should be. In the absence of any other phenomena, um, you should see this sort of regular decrease. So nobody really knew what to make of this. Um, and we wondered whether there was some, some bias, some artifact of having only sampled the moon in quotes. Um, what, what's happening right here is also interesting, although it's not the very surprising part. Um, first of all, there is overall a tendency for a maximum at about 3.5 billion years ago, and this is a time of a major impact on the moon, which has been well documented um, by some of my colleagues just a couple of years ago. And these spiky remnants are probably basically the remnants from what's called the late heavy bombardment, but the problem is that this record is, is kind of self-erasing because younger impacts erase the evidence of older impacts. And so we think that this is partly just a, a function of partial uh, retention of the record. So this, this all you know, more or less makes sense. But this is the really surprising part. So we didn't really know quite what to make of this. So we went to another random site, the Apollo 12 site, <laughs> and we find, in this case, even more abundance of these very young spherules which clearly date impacts. I mean, there's no question that these are dating impacts. And here again, with a strong concentration within the last 500 million years, and essentially nothing of this earlier ones. So this really makes men suspect that there, there was something real that happened on the moon 500 million years ago, or in that neighborhood. And what we now believe um, is the following, but first, um, looking at other kinds of data, there's a fairly well-known distribution of ages from the uranium, thorium, helium system um, on various kinds of chondrite meteorites, uh, which are shown in these three plots. So these are three different chemical groups of chondrites. This is the H group, this is the L group, and this is the LL group, and these are based on various criteria, including oxygen isotope concentration and other composition criteria. And 
these contracts have formation ages that are 12 plus billion years old. But the uranium thorium helium system is very sensitive to resetting because helium is easily lost during any sort of heating event. And what are shown here are by these numbers, these are different subcategories of the research H, which was H3, H6, H5, H4, etc. And this just shows that around 500 million years ago, there was one H4, one H3, and one H6, and over here, one H5, one H4, and one H4. So there's a little peak of these various kinds of H group contracts by about 500 million. In the L group, there's a very strong peak in this memory, and nothing in the LL group. So that's interesting because it's sort of comparable to what's happening with, with the lunar record. Remember that what these what these ages mean is the time of last significant peak. That's what uranium, thorium, helium ages mean. Now, if we look at um, argon-argon ages for a number of the same types of meteorites from glassy material, which is formed by shock metamorphism on the meteor, you see a very similar pattern with the L and the H contracts showing a peak around 500 million, 300 million in the similar time range. So, um, so this, this is broken down by different types of contracts, and this is broken down by whether they're plateau ages or isotherm intercept ages, um, the same kind of thing. So these two types of chondrites show a major event at about the same time as we see a peak in lunar bombardment. So it's not too hard to imagine that what this represents is a major collision in an asteroid belt. Here's the sun, here we are, here's Mars, here, here's Jupiter way off here. And the asteroid belt is in between Earth and Jupiter. And this is where it's believed that the parent body for the, for the H and the L chondrites, um, or LL chondrites rather, um, come from. So it's not too hard to imagine that there was a collision between the parent body of the LL chondrites and the parent body of the H chondrites out here in the asteroid belt. And um, what normally causes these kinds of things is the orbit of Jupiter, which is so massive that when Jupiter goes into resonance with other planets, um, it, can, it can cause major disturbances in the asteroid belt. And so what we think happened is that there was a collision between these two different parent bodies of these chondrites, and the dispersion of ages between 500 million years and basically now, I mean, it's the, the record seems to be not discrete, but over the last 500 million years, looks like that's the variation in gravitational infall times that is actually consistent with calculations for how long it takes material to come from here to the Earth and to other worlds the Sun, where the, the, the gravitational effects are most. 10 to 100 million years is a typical infall time. So that's what we think happened. So th this is another, another interesting story that we can, we can infer from argon-argon gene chronology. And I should add that there's really a, no other technique that could date these kinds of materials. There's no other radioisotopic technique that would be capable of doing this. Okay, next example is has to do with the, the, the theme of what's called thermochronology. So argon is a noble gas and it diffuses fairly rapidly in most silicate minerals, in most materials. And so when argon is formed by radioactive decay of potassium at high temperatures, it diffuses out of the, out of the mineral or the material very rapidly if the material is at high temperatures. Once it cools, the argon does not diffuse anymore. It diffuses very strongly at constant temperatures. And um, many years ago, um, almost 40 years ago, whoops, 
Martin Dodson um, came up with the concept of what's called closure temperature. And closure temperature is a concept that can be applied not only to geochronology, but also to petrology and any, any process that involves diffusion. And closure temperature, conceptually, is the temperature below which diffusion becomes negligible. So if you take any sample, let's say a you know, potassium feldspar or a biotite, whatever, and heat it <coughs> above its closure temperature, it will start to lose argon very rapidly. So similarly, if you take one of these minerals and crystallize it in a magma, the, the argon that's produced by radioactive decay of potassium will not begin to be retained in that mineral until it cools below its closure temperature. So closure temperature is it's conceptually just that concept. And what Dodson derives is a definition of closure temperature Depen depends on a lot of different variables. So let me just go through these. Um, so P sub C, closure temperature, equals R, which is the gas constant, um, times a formula called E, which is the activation energy for diffusion, times the um, natural logarithm of this quantity, and this A is its shape factor which is the shape of what the diffusion um, uh, volume looks like. So um, for a sphere, the shape factor is 55. For a cylinder, which is a good approximation for minerals like biotite, let's say, or nesterite, because diffusion basically goes only parallel to the sheet and not perpendicular. So that can be referred to as a cylindrical diffusion geometry. So A is just a number that, that characterizes the shape. D naught, or D sub zero, is called the frequency factor. And A is the diffusion dimension. Sorry, I didn't put A in here. So A is the distance that an atom has to travel to get out of a crystal. happens to be A squared. Um, oh, and I forgot tau. Tau is defined in this way. It's, again, the gas constant, the absolute temperature in Kelvin squared, um, uh, the closure temperature in absolute Kelvin degrees, divided by E, which is the activation energy again, and DT, DT is the cooling energy. So notice that some of these parameters appear in multiple places. So the activation energy appears here, that is in tau, and also here. More importantly, the closure temperature itself appears here and here. It appears on both sides of the equation. So that may seem like, well, how do you do it? Um, well, it's actually pretty easy. The way this is solved is iteratively. So if you know the value of the activation energy and all these other parameters, you guess a closure temperature, solve for the closure temperature, and then take the value that you solve, substitute it back in here, and do that until you get convergence, until you get the same answer here. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty standard technique. And after usually two or three times, if you make even a wildly reasonable guess um, initially, you'll get convergence. So closure temperature is easily calculated if you know these parameters. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about what these things mean. Um, I think I've already described what most of these parameters are, but there are two that have special conceptual importance. One is this E, activation energy. And activation energy is basically how much energy you have to supply to the system to make the diffusion happen. And the other important parameter is this frequency factor, which is um, basically how hard you have to push to keep the atom going. That's, that's the frequency factor. This is also um, known as the diffusivity at infinite temperature. OK? 
okay? So you can estimate this. You can actually measure this. This is the diffusion distance. And you have to know something about the cooling rate. And you have to have some information about the activation energy and the frequency factor in order to calculate the flow rate. And most of these parameters we can actually determine in the laboratory. There's certain minerals 